today, I got a picture of a judge declaring <coughs> somebody guilty to take him away. Because that's really what the passage is about. It's about, do you going to make a plea deal while you're still alive? Or are you going to come to Judgment Day and have the judge drop the hammer on you? And truly, none of us can withstand Judgment Day. Not a single one of us. We're all guilty. Guilty as guilty can be. Only those who come to Christ and have their sins forgiven by what Christ did on the cross are going to not receive the guilty verdict on Judgment Day. There's not one single person in all of humanity, in all of the world, in all of time who does not come to Judgment Day. And the only way to escape Judgment Day, if you think about it with today's type of things and the way this passage puts it, is to make a plea deal. And the plea deal is to plead the mercy and the grace of God and to come to Him now while we're still alive. Okay? And it's so important. And I, I tried to grab a picture. I wanted to get a picture of like a really hard hammer slamming down. All I had were these the guys with the little tiny <laughs> hammers. But that was fine. You know, it's Shutterstock. I found this thing on, online. But here's the picture. is is truly the hammer of God is going to be much worse of a verdict of judgment than anything any human judge could ever, ever give right here, you know? And, uh, and this is the truth. And here we see somebody with the handcuffs and the guilty, and they're going to go away. And so many people think that they're a good person, and on Judgment Day, they'll be okay. And the Bible is very clear with this, that none of us are good people. Not a single one of us is a good person in the eyes of God. I love great comfort. He goes through his stuff with the Ten Commandments. Every single one of us has broken every single commandment. There's not a commandment we haven't broken. Even the sin of murder, it says in the Bible, if you just hate your brother, you hate somebody, you're angry, you've already committed murder in your heart. Because that's where murder starts. It starts with hatred right there. So, so it's a pretty intense uh, picture I tried to bring, but it's an intense passage too. And I named it Before the Fire Falls. So it starts off, I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. This is Jesus talking. He said, he's not talking about uh, peace. He's not talking about a fluffy wonder and, and high fives and, and hippie love, okay? We don't see that. We see him talking about coming to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Not only that, he wishes it had already happened. He wishes it had already come is what it says with Jesus. This is the words of Jesus. These are the words in red. I had a conversation with a fellow a few weeks ago. And he told me how he only believes the words of Jesus that are read in the Bible. And as I listened to him talk, I quickly realized that he is not one who would like a verse like this. And I thought, man, I could read him a lot of verses in red. And I bet he would rather have verses in black <laughs> for a whole bunch of them. Is I thought, Jesus, all the words in the Bible are truly the words of Jesus Christ. With the black words, red words, from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation 22, it's all the words of Jesus Christ. These are words in red are the ones that he spoke while he was on this earth. But all the words in the Bible come from Jesus Christ. They come from God. But here he says that he came to cast fire upon the earth and how he wished it already kindled. And there's a lot of debate, you know, like maybe he's thinking... That he's considering this as the uh, the kindled as his as his baptism. It talks in the next verse that he's going to undergo, which is on the cross, receiving the judgment and the wrath of God, or whether this is the end time judgment when he comes and returns to the earth. I tell you, one sermon that hit me hard, and Jason and Ben were there too, was uh, Steve Lawson. It's the second to last sermon if you look at the Shepherd Conference to watch. You're only going to watch one. I picked that one right there, maybe, if you really want one to invigorate you. But he talks about Revelation 19, and that Jesus is coming back on a white stallion with a robe that's dipped in blood. And that robe dipped in blood, if you go into the words, it means doused, drenched. And he and they took you over to Isaiah, and the same passage in Isaiah, and it gives a little bit more detail. It's not his blood that it's drenched with. It's his enemy's blood that it's drenched with. It's the people on the earth that he's come to judge. And he's drenched in the blood as he's killing all of them. And he's and he, and he said many times, he is the killing king, Jesus. 
And you think about this, you don't often hear about Jesus described as the killing king, but indeed the Bible does describe him as the killing king. When he returns again, it won't be as a suffering servant for people to hit him and mock him and spit on him and shun him. He will come back and there will be no more hope whatsoever. The hammer will fall and it won't be like a little hammer. It would be like if you've ever watched Marvel Comics or something and you see Thor with that giant hammer and when it smashes the ground, lightning shoots up to the sky and the ground shakes. Talk about that kind of hammer will be the kind of hammer of judgment when Christ returns and there will be no mercy. Not one bit of mercy. Nobody gets mercy on the day that Christ returns. It's absolute. It is final. And truly, it should terrify us to think about this for people we know that aren't saved. It should terrify us for ourselves if we don't have assurance of our salvation. And, and it's something that is truly terrifying. And Jesus says to us in this passage, he says, I've come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish you were already kindled. And I wrote on the top here, wrote, the fire is the spiritual power exercised by the Lord through his word and spirit to the undoing of those who reject him and to the refining of those who believe in him. So for those who have faith in Christ, that fire refines us. There's a song that we sing sometimes. Uh, oh, it's one of my favorite songs. And it's slipping me the name of it right now. But it, no. It's about grace is what it's about. And it talks about one of the verses. It says that he's going to take us through the fire and he's going to like dross and the dross will be burned off. What is it? How firm a foundation is the, is the song. That's for sure. How firm a foundation. And, and it says that that's what we do. And through our lives as Christians, indeed, none of us are perfect. We're all sinful. We're all, we're all troubled. We're all broken nature. We're all human beings with a human nature, and as we walk the Christian life and as we come close to God, He burns off the stuff that's bad for us right there. He refines us. He makes us holy and more holy. But for those who don't know Christ, that fire destroys them. So we can see this fire in two ways right there, in a good way for the believer and in a bad way for those who don't believe. And here... The fire is always a negative message in the book of Luke. If you read about fire throughout the whole book of Luke, you're going to read it in very negative images. And it will bring purification by separating the evil from the good. And I'll tell you, it made me think, I read some stories and things like this, and I read a story about a guy running away from a fire and how it was quiet, and then it was so loud it was roaring, and he barely escaped with his life, and how thankful he was that he got out from the fire. But I thought of one of my own stories is when I was a young fellow in the military, they always are burning woods in, in the south. I don't know why they don't do it up here. It's probably good because it's always stinky like, like, like smoke all the time, especially this time of year. If you drive through the south, you're going to smell smoke, and you'll see forest fires lit all over the place, and they're contained, and they're only like maybe five feet high in the forest is the flames. It doesn't burn up the big trees, but it burns up all the brush. But they have to do that so a giant forest fire doesn't come. And I thought of how many times I was in the woods and I was we were playing army stuff and uh, and there's and there's uh, and there's and you're right by the edge of the forest flames. You don't think much of it. Fortunately, fire is such a controlled fire burn right there. And then afterwards, you walk through and just everything is black. But within a few months, all the green comes back up again and it refreshes everything. And it's amazing. So it's amazing what fire can do, and it can be very, very dangerous. I said it the other day to somebody, maybe it was our Bible study, there's a lady named Michelle and her husband named John, and they had their house burn up in a fire in Medina uh, several years back. And it had to be such a terrible, terrible experience that happened to them. And one thing that I said in the Bible study that was such a witness to everybody was even though they lost everything they had in that fire, they had pages of the King James Bible were floating all over the neighborhood. And all their neighbors brought them back pages of it, and they put it inside of a Ziploc bag, and they showed it to me. And it was really impressive. And to them, it was like a testament of God, you know. And their neighbors probably thought it was a testament of God, too, because all over their yards and everywhere, you know, with the flames and the way the wind rushes up were pages of the King James Bible right there. So, what a beautiful thing. But that's the kind of 
kind of thing we look at. And when you think about that too, you think about a fire burning down your house and everything you have, it really does help you get a perspective of stuff. What is the most important thing in this life is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single thing in this life is going to disappear one day. The only thing that's going to stay through the fire, through the judgment, is do you know Jesus Christ? That's all that matters in the end. Everything else will come to an end right there for you as a person. And it says, uh, but I wrote down here, Jesus was speaking, of course, about the baptism into death by crucifixion. The fiery trial he would go through when he suffered the wrath of God against our sin on the cross. He was speaking about the ways of hellish curse that he would endure for our salvation. Already he was suffering for it, and he was not turning back. How I am totally governed by this until it be finally accomplished was his attitude. Apart from this willing sacrifice, we could never be saved. And you think about this, as Jesus is on the cross, and he says this verse here, he's on the, he's on the way to the cross. He knows where he's going. Jesus was born to die it says, even in the Luke, in the beginning of Luke, it says he came to save us from our sins and those whom he is pleased. That doesn't mean everybody. That means those who are going to be believers. Those are the only ones who peace was coming for, who salvation from sins was coming for. We're definitely not of the sort that believe in the end, everybody gets saved, everybody's okay, there is no hell. We don't believe the hell isn't populated, it's an empty place, it's a place that is giant with so many people, it's uncomfortable. Because it says in the Bible, broad is the highway to hell, narrow is the path to heaven. It's not an empty place, as much as we surely would like to hope it be an empty place. It's not. And here, we see that Jesus, since he knew that was his destiny, and that's exactly what's going to happen, he wouldn't let anything stop it. If you remember in uh, in Matthew, Mark, when, when Jesus, when when Peter tells Jesus he's the Christ, and he says, you didn't know this on your own, but, but the Holy Spirit gave it to you to know this, within just two or three verses, Peter says, oh no, I'll never let you be crucified, I'll never let you die, and he says, Satan, get behind me, because that was his mission, and nothing was going to stop him from his mission. But while it was his mission, he knew how horrible it was going to be. He knew he was going to sweat drops of blood and anguish and stretch and pain which probably none of us will ever experience that type of pain. I, I myself have seen a lot of people in pain but I've never seen somebody sweat a drop of blood. Not single, not one single time. I don't know if anybody ever has. If you have, tell me about it. Not right now, but after church I'd love to hear about it. I'm so sad that somebody went through that much. But just imagine that and yet this is where he's going and he will not stop until he gets there. And he says, I wish, I wish that this baptism had already undergone right there. I wish my, I have a baptism undergo and how distressed I am until it's finished. And you think about this too. Jesus had stress. Stress. Think about that, you know. He had stress. We all have stress too. We can all relate to stress for sure. A lot of our stress we surely shouldn't have, okay. We surely should be holding that. 1 Peter 5, 7, Heinz 57. We mm -hmm. I say that because it's easy to remember where Heinz 57 is. 1 Peter 5, 7 is cast your anxieties upon the Lord, for he cares for you. But now that's good. That's what we do. But there are things in this life that are still going to stress us some right there. But about half of them at least, that should take care of it right there. <laughs> Leave it with Jesus. Trust him and move on. But some things still stress us a bit. And look, we even see the Lord himself, how distressed he was until his time would come right there while he's on this earth. He says, do you think that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division, okay? So everybody's always focusing in on unity and talking unity. Unity among the brothers is a beautiful thing. It says it. There's a scripture that says that. Unity among the believers is a beautiful thing. But that unity does not come at the cost of everything else. The unity doesn't come at the cost of compromise for truth. It doesn't come at the cost of, of, uh, of saying everything's okay. You know, nothing really matters. It's not an absolute relativism for sure. We have absolute, absolutes is what we believe. We're not a people who believe in relativism. We believe in absolutes. We believe in exclusivism. Exclusivism is that there's only one way to heaven. 
through Jesus Christ. It's not a multiple ways. It doesn't include other religions. It doesn't include other ways. Only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of that, there is much no peace. There is much division that goes on, okay? And we can look at one angle too with this, with division with churches. You know, if we're believing in Jesus Christ and loving the Lord Jesus, we're brothers and sisters, no matter whatever church that is. If they believe in the right Jesus and they believe and, and, they, and they follow him and they adhere to him, the brothers and sisters in Christ, but we should never take that to some extreme in the church to say, well, doctrine divides, and why is there all these different types of churches and all these things? That's kind of a ridiculous thing to say. Because we all know as soon as you start to read the Bible, as soon as you say, I believe who Jesus is, you are practicing doctrine, teaching, doctrine. To try to despise doctrine, I, 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 I put it in the picture like I want to be like a hippie and jump up and down and go, yay, Jesus, yay, Jesus. And I have absolutely no other brain cells or nothing at all about me. Okay, that's, none of us want some type of church like that or to live like that and it's so shallow and it's so momentary and it's so much just to show there's no depth whatsoever. We want teaching and when we have teaching, we're going to have some people who think this way, some people who think that way. And the key is, is what does the Bible say? And I'll tell you what, I can respect all of them to a degree if what they're ta teaching is from the Bible. The ones I can't respect are the ones who are teaching something from the world point of view or from some kind of cultural type of view that says everybody's okay. That I can't respect. I love to learn about different denominations in the Christian faith and why they believe what they believe because I understand them better. It brings me to truly a peace with them. I may not agree with them, but if it's coming from the Bible, I can appreciate it and I can love it. Right? But here, here we see, I wrote on the top here, you know what I wrote on the top, you, can, you can't read it, CNN Worldview, okay? CNN, I always say CNN Worldview because I think what's the best way to describe the worldview of the world that we're not supposed to have, that's supposed to be the enemy of our worldview, that's supposed to be something that we are set apart from with a biblical worldview, and the best thing that I can think, at least in my time lately, is the CNN Worldview. If you're picture of life is CNN, you have a worldly worldview and you do not have a biblical worldview. But the CNN worldview would say, personally I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my means of gaining God's permanent favor and a place in heaven. That's, that's good. But, here's the bad, someone else could get to heaven based upon living an exemplary life. This is what a lot of people believe. Tons of people believe this, that there's some way to heaven outside of Jesus Christ. That they could be a really good person and when they die, they're going to go to heaven. The Bible is adamantly clear that that is not the case. Think of John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except by me. Only through Jesus. And there's another verse in Acts. I think it's Acts 4, 12. It says there's only one name under all of heaven, underneath all the sky, which men must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus. It's the only name. All right? Truly, if you come to some crazy place in your theology and you think that uh, some native who never heard the Lord Jesus Christ's name and practices his pagan religion and does the best he can can go to heaven, then you surely should not be for missions because when you send that missionary there preaching Jesus Christ or repent your sins and salvation, they're going to burn in hell. They're now hopeless. You took them from a place of eternal hope to a place of eternal damnation, and we know that that is totally contrary to the Bible because we're told to go and tell and to go to all the ends of the earth. So we know there's desperation, and it's not just for some kind of nice idea that we're all on the same page. It's for people's lives who are going to live forever in one place or the other, and it is a desperate situation. And, uh, and we don't have this CNN worldview that oh, even though I have my faith in Christ, I'm sure the other guys are all okay too. That's not our view. It's not the biblical view. All roads do not lead to God. That's for sure. All religions, gods, are not the same God. The best bumper sticker to have is this one that says, contradict, contradict. I've seen a few people have it. Mm -hmm. The one that most people have, though, is one that calls coexist. 
and coexist has all these different pictures of different religions and how we should all just coexist on the same way. Contradict shows that none of them agree with one another on major points, not little points, but major points. But one example, the Muslim faith, right now it's the time of Ramadan, it's their, their high holy month, but here in, in the Muslim religion, their most gravest sin they have is called the sin of shirk. The sin of shirk is that you believe that God is not one. Well, in their picture, us believing in the Trinity, we don't believe in one God in their view. So we are committing the sin of shirk by believing that Jesus Christ is God. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons who exist in one God. So we have already committed their greatest sin that sends them to the deepest parts of hell. And also, they strictly, strictly do not believe that Jesus died on the cross. And they do not believe that he paid for our sin. And that is great sin for them to believe that. And that is our most foundational belief as a Christian. So there is no way that the Muslims and us worship the same God. So when a Muslim tells you, we worship the same God, which many Muslims will tell you if you get around a Muslim... You don't have to mean it. Be very loving, be very graceful about it, but let them know, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Do you believe He died for sin? Do you believe that He rose the third day? Do you believe that? Well, no. Well, then you and I do not worship the same God, and you cannot say that we have the same God. And this is very true. And Jesus did not, He came not come to grant peace on the earth in that type of a way. It says here, it says, it says we are either for Jesus or against Him. And this division draws a line down the middle of the human race. This is what Jesus came to bring. Not peace, but division. Our first allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And there are times when his claim on our lives brings us into conflict with other people. And this surely does happen. In this passage, we're going to see it even happens within our own families. Okay? For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, and two against three. So we see the own families. Luke 14, 26. We're going to be there in a couple weeks. Maybe a month. Maybe a month and a half. I don't know. We'll see how it plays out. Next week we're 13, 1 and 9. But if anyone comes to me, Jesus says, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You're talking about extreme allegiance that Christ demands. He's not asking you or begging you to give him a little bit of your life, to, to have him to be just one part of your life is with Jesus. He's asking 100% of everything you are to love him so much against everything else in life, it would look as if you hate even your own self and your own family members in life. And that's the allegiance that Christ requires. That's biblical faith. That's a Christian. Not like a crazy Christian, that's a normal Christian right there, okay? It may take us a while to get there sometimes in our faith walk and strength, but this is exactly where it should be. It's like I, I mentioned a few times that book that I read, I read another book too, it talked about how, how we should be on the path to be a holy martyr. If you think about it in your Christian life, you should be on the path to be a martyr. If someone were to call you to deny Jesus Christ, and if they were to put you on a judgment seat of the world with the gavel, and they were to say, are you guilty or innocent, and guilty demands the death penalty, you should honorably and unashamedly say, I will not refuse Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. Take my life, because it belongs to Him. It does not belong to you. That's where it should be. There's a guy we hit in Bible site too, on Thursday, Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John, the Apostle John. And Polycarp gave his, it was burned at the stake, strangled and burned at the stake at 86 years old. Can you imagine me, an 86 year old man. And they gave him a chance to say, Is your king Caesar or is your king Jesus? And he said, All these years I've served him and how good he's been to me. Why would I deny him now? And they burned him alive. Can you just imagine being burned alive? It'd be a horrible, horrible thing. But you know what you'd have to hold on to? Oh, what a great reward I'm about to have in the kingdom of heaven when I am a holy martyr for my God. This should be something we aspire to be. This should not be something that we're afraid to be. 
It should not be something that we would refuse to be, okay? We see that this is the path that we're on. And it's also like, I read this book, Pilgrim's Regress, slowly reading it. It's not the same as progress, but it's regress, but it goes along the same lines. And this guy meets a guy named Mr. Sensibility. And Mr. Sensibility says, I, I, I believe in Jesus Christ, and, and, or the landlord, that's what they call him in the book, the landlord of God. And, and, and he goes, I believe in the landlord, but I only believe in it in one part. It's just one part. It's not my whole life. It's just one part. And he said, because it's a, it's a great thing with history and human history, and it's made such a mark. So, of course, I believe in it, but he doesn't believe in it in a saving way. And a saving way means I just, I just hold that a little bit. Like, once in a while, I'll believe in Jesus right there. That's not the kind of faith that we're to have. We're to be an all-the-time type of Jesus type of people. And he's supposed to control and command and direct us in every single facet of our lives. And we see this, that it's even going to divide the house. And I can think about this with local politics. I remember Rob Portman. I don't know if you remember Rob Portman. He's been gone now. And uh, Rob Portman was a pretty solid fella until his son became a homosexual. And when his son became a homosexual, he decided he's going to change the way he views gays because he loves his son and he's not going to turn his back on his son. That shows, that would be like the opposite of this verse right here. That would be like, instead of loving God over my family, I'll love my family over God. And there's absolutely no place in the scripture for that, with that kind of thing. Does that mean that if you have a son that turns gay, you don't love him? No, you still love him just the same way. He's your son until the day he dies, the day you die, you love each other like crazy. But you don't ever say that his horrible, wicked sin is okay because you love him. You still tell him, you're gentle, you let him know if he gets he gets married, you don't go to his wedding, you stay away from stuff like this. That's abomination things. You, you, you're totally against it, but yet you are for him because he's your son and you love him. But I tell you what, that's going to cause some division, big division, if that's how somebody identifies himself and goes there. And you can see it with so many. Rob Portman's not the only kind of guy you can look at in history or in politics who's done such a thing. Many have done these things, and it shows where is God's priority in your life. If it's secondary to your family, it's not in the right place. We have got to hold God as the first and foremost of all things in our lives, even above our own families. And this doesn't mean that you neglect your family, because it says in the Bible that you're worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever, if you don't provide for your own family. So you're supposed to love your family and things, but when it comes on priorities of things in life, God is above family. All right, And we see this right here with what Jesus is saying. And he goes into it more. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You know, Jesus isn't just like whipping this off the side and be like saying this and then it not really is. It surely has. You know, there are people that turn each other in. There's there's people that, uh, you know, hate each other within their own families. Why? Because of the faith. And does that mean that you could say, well, you know what, I just won't talk about the faith. I'll pretend I'm not in the faith to cause peace in my family. No, no, that's not what that should mean. And it doesn't mean as well that you purposely cause trouble in your family. You know, you've got to be full of grace. You've got to be full of wisdom. You've got to be uh, as wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove. But you do not deny Jesus Christ and you live for him, and you let your light shine, okay? And if you think about it, if you truly believe in Jesus Christ, and you know your family does not believe in Jesus Christ, then you also know what's going to happen to them the moment they take their last breath. They will be in a suffering so intense that we can't even begin to imagine it with whatever kind of imaginations or likenings we could possibly give. It will be far worse it would be an act of hatred against our families for us to deny Jesus Christ in front of them and condone their sin and stay with this. And I wrote on top, holding on to Jesus will separate you from others, and not simply from any others, but from others who matter the most to you. Love for Jesus may mean you will lose the love of those you love most. Coming to Jesus may be the only, the beginning of your problems, because that's where it starts with our family unit. Micah 7, 6. 
the Old Testament. This verse is like right out of the Old Testament right here. It's not verse for verse. That's why it's not capitalized right here. But if you look at Micah 7, 6, it's the same thing. It says the faith will cause division within families. All right? And even the most basic unit of the society is the family. It will be divided over the faith. All right? So there is division. It's not unity, unity, unity in that type of a sense of taken to an extreme. I read something... It was from uh, C.S. Lewis, and oh, it was so good. He said, whenever you explore a subject, you need to not only explore one side of the extreme, but explore to the other side of the extreme as well, and look at everything in between. And I think that's good <coughs> preaching as well, too, because if we get too caught up and we're too crazy on one side, next thing you know, none of us will have any families or anything. We'll just be the only people who are all ostracized from everybody. That's not what I'm trying to say here at all. What I'm trying to say, though, is that we do not deny God. And having the faith will surely cause trouble in your family, okay? It doesn't mean you keep, don't keep struggling in your family to show them love, to be there, to try to see that they would believe as well, too, okay? We have to look at this on the entire spectrum. We can't be somebody like, uh, I truly don't like to be called fundamental, okay? I heard John MacArthur, I read it once years ago, he said, fundamental stands for no fun, too much damn, and not enough mental, okay? So I don't like to be called a fundamental, okay? But then again, these days, if you just believe in absolute, sometimes they'll call you a fundamental, and I thought, well, if you say, if I believe in absolutes, I'm a fundamentalist, then in your definition, I am a fundamentalist, okay? But in my definition for church stuff, I am not a fundamentalist, okay? I'm a biblical fellow. A fundamentalist is almost like a, a broken gas gauge, you know. Say you had a car and it got broke on full and you keep driving. You're like, man, praise the Lord. I'm getting the best gas mileage I've ever had in my whole life. And all of a sudden you run out of gas because it was a broken gas gauge. And like I said, that pendulum that swings left to right, a fundamentalist will slam up against the extreme side and never be able to leave the extreme side right there. And it... And it Hinders your walk with Christ is what it does. Praise God that you're so intense on Jesus. I don't ever say the fundamentalists aren't believers, man. They're believers and they love Jesus like crazy. But sometimes they can get so stuck on one thing, they can't move off of that one thing. And it's very hard for them to grow. And it's very hard for everybody else around them. It would be very hard within their own families for any kind of salvation to happen because they're causing so much of a, of a scene and a trouble, okay? But we continue on. And he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it happens. All right? And what did this mean? I've got the next slide, so I won't go into that too much right here. But, but basically, he turns to the crowds, and he shows the disciples are no longer his primary target. Because look at this. So before he's talking to his disciples, and now he's talking to the crowds. So he's talking to the crowds and he's looking at all the people, okay? All this tough stuff, words, this was for his disciples right here. This was for his followers. Think about this. If you were talking about Jesus for the first time to somebody, you wouldn't be talking about this stuff right here probably. You know, that's way down a little bit in the weeds and the hard stuff. You took them into the swamp, okay? It's going to be hard for them in the swamp to be able to get anywhere with you right there. But this is a beautiful stuff that's for the disciples. But here now... He's turning to the crowds, and in the crowds, he tells them, when you see the signs coming, the signs happen with the weather, okay? And we see this, we see this, I read on top first, the south wind from the Sahara, what did it do? It brought scorching heat. I've been in the Sahara Desert, it's hot there. There's scorpions, there's, there's things that blow in with the sky, it can hurt you real bad, all right? They're like spiders that look like as big as your hand, and the people there call them wind scorpions. I think the people in Iraq call them, call them camel spiders. And they bite you, and they kill the area where they bite, and it turns all black, and it's horrible. And they're all over the place. And the wind just blows in, okay? And it's a massive wind. When you see it, it's like the movies, where you see something hundreds of feet high, just a cloud moving towards you. You're like, oh my gosh, get cover now, because soon it'll be like millions of babies hitting me all over the place, and you'll be breathing them and everything. That's why the people in the desert wear the stuff that wraps around their face so they have a covering over their mouth and their nose but they see it and they know when the signs are coming and jesus says that when you see a south wind blowing you say it will be a hot day 
and it happens, okay? Up there in Israel, they probably didn't get as extreme, I don't know, I haven't been to Israel, but it probably wasn't extreme, it's in the middle of the Sahara, but the Sahara is huge, it's like half of all of Africa, and it's below Israel, right? And when they had the south wind blowing, they knew the heat was going to come, and it was going to be hot, and and they, the problem was, though, they didn't recognize the scorching fire of eternal judgment that was looming on the horizon for them. And neither do many people today realize that judgment is coming. It surely is. You hypocrites, you know how to examine the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not examine this present time? All right? And think about this. He was talking to a religious people. The Israelite people all went to church. They all did sacrifice. They all, they all followed all the steps. They did all these things, and yet they weren't living for God on the inside. There was no truth on the inside. We talked about that too in Bible. We had a good Bible study for this. I tell you, come to Bible study Thursday. You want to come to some good stuff. What we talked about that too is two of the ways that I believe you can see are you saved? You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is one. Do you pray? Do you pray on your own? Like, not pray just in church. Not pray just with other people when they're around you. Not just pray for your food, but truly pray to God on your own. You know, in the middle of the night, as you walk on through the day, wherever you are, do you have a prayer life? If you don't have a prayer life, I read in a book by J.C. Rao once, he's a good fellow, he pointed out probably you don't have a Christian life. Probably you're not really a believer if you're not praying. We need to be praying to God and trusting Him all the time. Otherwise, you are constantly trusting your own self, your own wisdom, your own ways, and you're never turning to God. A guy told me yesterday, a good guy, Louis, Louis Berrios is his name. He runs a, a little place to visit in Akron. He's a very good guy. If you ever want to take a short vacation for a few days, it would be great help to him because that's how he makes his living right there. And He has a little house and it's, it's a really good house. But Louis told me, he said, the most common prayer he prays of all prayers is the prayer that says, help me, help me. And I thought, man, I never thought about it like that, but it's just true. Isn't that the prayer that we pray if we're a believer all the time? Help me. That should come out of our voice all the time throughout the day and the troubles and everything that go on. Help me, okay? If you're not asking God to help you, are you trusting in Him? Do you believe in Him? With folks that are hypocrites, folks that just go through the... the, the the, the, the outside type of stuff. They don't really believe. They don't have faith. They don't reach out to Christ in those kind of times. And Jesus calls these guys hypocrites because they are not on the path to heaven even though they were people who followed the book. They followed their law. They followed their book. They did their sacrifice. Isaiah 6, 9 called them that they were seeing and not seeing. They were hearing and not hearing, which was a very hard thing for Isaiah because these are the people he was told that he was going to be a, a prophet for a uh, a preacher for all the days of his life, and he, God said, I'm going to send you to a people who sing, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. And it's so sad, and we want to desperately pray all the time for ourselves, God, help me to see, help me to hear, help me to understand your truth, and to apply it, and to live it in my life. And truly, that is all the better. I go, go back to the king. Man, Luke, if you got Jeremiah on Thursday, you're really like, man, this is a little bit uh, <laughs> recap. But the kingship of a bad king is tyranny against you. It's horrible against you. It causes you all kinds of oppression, okay? The thing about the kingship, the kingship in the states today, they keep advertising on Facebook that you can have free solar energy. Well, I looked into that. You can have free solar energy, and anything you get that's extra goes to your neighbors. So in case the power goes out, you have no energy whatsoever. <laughs> Because you have to share it with everybody else. And what kind of good kingship is that? When all of a sudden things go bad and you've got nothing. Because, because that's the way it is. And truly, if you look at our society and things today, you know, we do, we live in a very blessed country here, but there's a lot of things like that and some other things. There's people who would love to take us more into a communism type of picture of oppression where it's a terrible king over top of us. And we need to know that King Jesus... He is gentle and lowly. I've got a whole bunch of books. If you ever want to read one, I still got like a whole box of them. I got them for free. Okay, called Gentle and Lowly. And oh, is it a good book about how much Jesus loves you. But King Jesus, following him, is wonderful. 
Like I read these things, I speak this stuff, I say this, and you think, oh my gosh, it's this harsh. Oh my, it's this hard. Really, it's beautiful. And it's comforting. And it's the most biggest peace you can ever have because you know that you're so deeply loved by the creator of the world, by Jesus Christ himself. You're totally forgiven. The hammer's never going to fall on you because it fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is beautiful, okay? So I hope I don't come across in the wrong way. I come across strongly because it's important because we need to wake up and see things, but it's to the most beautiful thing that we need to wake up and see things, the following the Lord Jesus Christ. And why do you not even judge for yourselves what is right? All right, so he asked him this, and he basically is letting him know, don't procrastinate on such an issue like the gospel and where you stand in judgment today, all right? I tell you what, with my dissertation, I did my doctorate, I procrastinated. I procrastinated because I was so stressed. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to go. I didn't know what to do. Everything I started was a dead end, a dead end, a dead end. A dissertation is like no other college class a person ever takes. It's like no other experience, I think, that a person will ever go through. And it's not something that you can just sit down and knock out. It's a tremendous thing. It's like uh, Philip told me, you're eating the elephant. How do you do it? One bite at a time. Unfortunately, I had guys like Philip constantly prodding me. Hey, how you doing? Did you write something? Did you do something? Look, look. Oh. And I procrastinated, but thank God I didn't procrastinate long enough that I that I lost all the money that was paid from my college for mm -hmm. going to my classes and everything and ended up being what they call an ABD, all but dissertation. I knew fellows like that. I know a fellow like that who's a minister for Southern Baptist. And man, he's a wonderful fellow. And his wife tells everybody, he's an ABD. <laughs> and I just think every time I hear it, I would say, oh, I don't want that to hit on me. And I heard somebody say, what would you rather have, the pain of discipline now or the pain of regret for all of your life? And I thought, I'd rather try to have the pain of discipline now. And it's the same way, like what Jesus is telling these people, to judge yourselves what is right. See what the signs are coming. Do not procrastinate on such an issue like the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to him today. Ask for forgiveness. Repent. Believe. And it says, For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate on your way there, make an effort to settle with him, so that he may not drag you before the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. This happens every day. When people get arrested for something, if they're guilty, the best thing for them to do is to make a deal. If they don't make a deal and the stuff comes out, it's far, far worse for them than not making a deal. We see this all the time throughout life and everything. We hear about with big corporations and big monies and we hear somebody had to pay $50 million. Well, why? Because they didn't want to see what would happen if they didn't have to pay all the money because of what would be coming. And Think about this. Jesus is using this as right now, here today, while you're still alive, repent and believe in Jesus. Make a deal with the judge, okay? And what is the deal with the judge? Is that you trust Jesus Christ for everything and that you know you're a sinner and you look to him to forgive you and pay the price. The problem is most people, we have so much pride in our simple nature, we want to say we don't have sin. We don't have anything so bad. God won't send us to hell forever. It surely does. It says in the Bible over and over again. And really, in the bottom of our heart, we know that. But that procrastination kicks in and thinks, you know what? I'm going to repent one day, but it's just not going to be today. And you hope and pray that somebody saying that is going to truly have a day that they're going to repent. Because I tell you what, like I talked about the dissertation stuff, I think I saw one percentage was 60% of people who start their doctorate degrees don't finish in their ABDs. It's not a few percent, it's 60%. If I ever get to teach a doctor class, that's the first thing I'm gonna tell them. I'm gonna tell them, okay, there's 10 of you in here today, six of you are gonna pay a lot of money, and you're never gonna graduate, and you're never gonna finish, because this is just the way that it really is, all the time. And it's intense, and it's heavy, and Jesus is letting them know, don't go before the judge. Make your deal before the judge. Realize that you are guilty and you're guilty of sin right here and right now. And you know what's going to happen on Judgment Day. The general context in this section of Luke is the final judgment. Jesus is giving us the friendly legal advice that we need to settle our case with God before it's too late. Jesus wants them to discern their window of opportunity now. Today is the day of salvation. It says in 2 Corinthians 6.2, that's one of the ones 
we should memorize, okay? Mm -hmm. Super important scripture, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Today is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow. Someone says, I'm going to think about that one day. Maybe I'll decide for Jesus. Be like, you should decide right here, right now, today. Because you don't know if a sudden death may come on you. This is an extreme urgency to settle now. And the last verse says, I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the last lepton, okay? Or penny, like Judy said, okay? Until you pay the last penny. And the, so I wrote on the top, the wicked shall be placed in hell until they pay their debt to the uttermost farthing. And as they never will pay it, it is certain that they will be there for all eternity. These are all quotes from famous theologians. For who is not reconciled to him in time, and is not bound to him in faith, will meet with irrevocable sufferings. He will never be able to pay off his debt of sin. In offending a holy, infinite, and eternal God, our sin itself is infinite and eternal. That is why we require a sacrifice that is of infinite worth. That is why the cross is our only hope. Because on the cross, Christ paid that debt. The only possible means of redemption for us is by grace. Everything we owe can be settled out of court. And it's all by the, the grace of Jesus Christ who died for you and I. In my last slide, Jesus said, it's a Bible verse, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. Not might have, not has a chance at having it, has it right now here today. And I know the majority of us right here today, I hope all of us right here today, have eternal life because we hear Jesus' word and we believe in him. And what does he say? He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Isn't that beautiful? The judgment, the hammer won't fall on you, okay? Because you pass from death into life already because all the bad stuff you ever did, Jesus Christ felt the shame for that and paid for that on the cross himself for you because he loves you so much. And we need to hold on to that. And there's two little things I got for you. If they should have seen it, then we certainly should. We have the testimony of the Gospels, which not only tell us what Jesus did, but also explain what it means. Then we have the rest of the New Testament to give us the true interpretation of Jesus and his salvation. Furthermore, we are living on the other side of the resurrection. God has raised Jesus from the dead. This is a sign that his sacrifice for sin has been accepted and that now through faith in him, our sins are forgiven and we have the hope of eternal life. See the signs of the cross and the empty tomb. Understand what they mean. Trust Jesus today for your salvation. Have you settled your case with God? How much better it is to settle it now through the cross of Christ than to settle it later by suffering the wrath of God? If Jesus had distress about the wrath of God that was going to come on him on the cross, imagine what kind of distress that would cause us who are not God. All right? Yet, tragically, some people never take the trouble to settle their case. According to David Gooding, they have not as yet discovered that their case is hopelessly bad and that God has already declared it to be so. They drift on through life towards the final judgment under the comforting but completely false illusion that though they are not perfect, they are not bad enough to be damned. If they persist in such unrealism, damned is precisely what they will be. And this is the words of the scripture. This isn't something that I'm lying about. This is definitely not a sermon that you would hear in a feel-good church because people want to come back. But I love you guys. I know you're going to come back because I know all of you, okay? And I pray that you come back. But it would be dishonest of me not to preach the scripture and the truth that's in there and to give the warning that it says. Lately, I've been thinking to myself, is to get older. I know I'm not that old, but I always think about dying all the time. I work with people dying. I see people dying on a daily basis. I'm always seeing this. So I'm always thinking stuff. And I think, how can I describe myself? How should I describe myself? And I think the way I should describe myself is as a heralder of the gospel. Think of like John the Baptist, a heralder of the gospel. And think about yourselves. Don't think, well, Buck's a pastor, so he should be. I think every one of us as believers should be a heralder of the gospel. We should share it in our lives wherever we can, to whoever we can, in whatever kind of places and avenues God has put us to share it. And I guarantee you, I see it constantly. I'm a huge guy about predestination. If you don't know that, you haven't been here that long. But I'm a big guy of predestination, but I can tell you what, the connections I see to so many things is just unbelievable all the time, okay? 
Even my brother, the other day, I told him, I met a fellow in the hospital, and, and he told me, I, his name was Rex, and I was so happy, I said, I hardly mean any Rex, said, my brother's name is Rex, and then he goes, and my nickname is Buck. And I thought, how could this be? All right? That I could meet a guy whose nickname was my brother's, his real name is my brother's name, nickname is my name, and we have some of the rarest names around. You don't run into too many Bucks or Rexes. Maybe you know a few people, but not the real names, but here we are. And then we got to talking about Jesus, and we got to talking about where it was in the Lord. And I told him, I said, I am sure this is a divine appointment between you and I. This was meant to be. And I tell you, as a herald of the gospel, you'll see these things as you're walking with Christ. You'll just start to see them all the time. And you'll be like, what beautiful God moments or God coincidences type thing, God incidents. It happens all the time. And we should view ourselves in the way that Christ views us. The problem with this world is we're not identifying with Jesus Christ. Somebody thinks they're a boy, there should be a girl, a girl that's a boy. They don't know who to identify with. They're totally lost out there. They are so confused. Why is this rampaging and coming to our children now? Because our schools have taken Jesus out of the schools. Because, because our society has taken Jesus out and we have no identity in Christ and people have no clue where they need to be. So it's so important that you and I know where we need to be, we know where our identity is, and that it's in Jesus Christ. And I beg you today, if Jesus Christ is not where our identity is, come to him today. Think, you know, think of that book I said, I am gentle, and my burden is light, and my yoke is easy. It truly is. Even though it sounds like so much, it's so much looking from a worldly perspective. Once you step into faith and you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the greatest comfort of all comforts because you know at any time, you could die and you'll be okay. You know at any time that God has total control over your life and everything going on and that he loves you so much, he sent his only son to die for you because he loves you so much. Think about how much he's going to care for you when you follow him and you go after him. Don't be somebody that comes to the time of the judgment without Jesus Christ. And with this, I'm going to pray. And I have a prayer book right here. And I'm going to write down some prayers.